This is part four of non-iterative and iterative image reconstruction methods, uh, where I'll introduce more on iterative reconstruction and uh, start to talk about uh, system modeling, or rather talk about that in a little bit more uh, detail for the cases that we've previously been considering. So an overview of iterative reconstruction is as follows. Uh, we are typically uh, trying to estimate parameters to represent an object, and uh, we may be using a parameter vector f. Uh, that's typically when uh, used with voxels, but in general, a parameter vector theta might be used for different basis uh, functions, because we could use uh, pixels, voxels, uh, regions of interest, whatever it might be. Um, then we have some measured data, and up to now we've been focusing on the case of back projected data, but um, in this video I want to uh, connect us back to sinograms again as well. Uh, but whatever the, back, whatever the measured data, um, that is obviously um, involved in iterative reconstruction, whether it's in sinogram form or back projected image form. Then we need uh, some model, how to get from the parameters to a model of the mean of the measured data. When we do this forward model step here, it is always for the mean of the data. We, we model the noise uh, separately uh, through the objective function, as we'll see. Um, so this needs to predict what the mean of the data would look like, or rather given an estimate of uh, the object representation parameters um, f, uh, now find what the corresponding mean is. Then we compare that mean to the actual noisy measurement using a cost function, a loss function, or an objective function. Um, that comparison is done. Um, we can inject prior information in here, and we'll, in later lectures, get onto uh, advanced methods for the prior information. And then we plug it into some optimization algorithm nearly always uh, related to the gradient of the objective function. So with least squares, it's going to be gradient descent. With uh, maximum likelihood, it's going to be related to gradient ascent. Um, and then that allows us to update the parameters such that when we run them through the system model again, uh, it now has a different model of the mean, which hopefully agrees better with the measured data subject, subject to any uh, prior information which can act as a penalty for the kind of data fidelity that's um, trying to go on between these two vectors. Okay, so we know already about the object representation parameters. This is just a, a simple example to really make the point clear. Uh, the object that you could be imaging would be, in general, a continuous uh, distribution. And remember, we're only ever estimating uh, a representation of the object. You can see in the picture of that cat the difference between the high-quality image, which is meant to, uh, if you like, capture the idea of an almost continuous function, such as a radio tracer distribution, whereas when we use pixels, obviously that uh, information gets lost to some extent, and we're just trying to find um, coefficients for those pixel or voxel um, basis functions. Uh, so that's captured by expressions such as this, where we have a coefficient associated with a particular basis function, nearly always pixels or voxels, add them all together with their unique coefficients to get just a representation of the object, which is really what image reconstruction is all about. There it is again, uh, just for a cross-section of, of a PET scan here, showing what we're assuming that's the continuous object, just as an illustration, and then we'd uh, discretize it, and then, as you know, stack it into one huge vector. Now, uh, the focus now really is going to be on the system model, how we get from uh, a parameter vector to a model of the mean. So here is an example of how we would uh, model uh, the mean of the data. So here's a point source um, inside a PET scanner field of view. Um, and what I'm showing here are example back-to-back -back photon pairs shown by those blue lines. And then here, I'm showing the back projection of those back-to-back -back photon pairs. And here, if you'll recall from an earlier video, this is showing the build-up of data um, counts being plotted or histogrammed into a sinogram uh, where this is the uh, radial 
distance of a line and that's the angle of the line. Um, and so that's going to be called a sinogram M and I refer you to the earlier video if you need a refresher on how we get sinograms uh, for pet data. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to show a few example events here. So just building up a few events. So you, hopefully you could see the statistics build up on the sinogram there as I collected more and more events up to 15,000 there. You could see this is now forming almost a straight line uh, because the point source is in the center of the field of view. And the back projected image is now looking like a, a very familiar point spread function or point response function. Now, what we're going to do is uh, model the mean of these noisy data sets. This is a noisy back projected image. This is a noisy sinogram. And what we're going to do now is just by using the simple model of line integrals, where we just, as you can see with these blue arrows, I'm just going to sum uh, this candidate image because obviously we don't know what the image is in, in the real situation with, with iterative reconstruction. We just have, for example, the sinogram and or the back projected image. So what we're going to do is if we have a candidate or a guess of what the object representation parameters should be, then what we're going to do is um, integrate along that estimate to get a prediction of the data or really a model of the mean of the data. So with line integrals, we just take parallel lines, integrate along the, um, the image in quotes, if you like the reconstructed image, the current guess, integrate along those lines, at a range of different angles. And so this is known as taking a projection, a 1D parallel projection at a range of different angles. So when we integrate along there, that's going to correspond to modeling one line of a sinogram, because a sinogram is just a stack of 1D parallel projections. So let's uh, go ahead now. So I'm saying if we know the object or if we have a guess of the object, and here you can see I've put in the known object just to prove a point here, uh, but in reality we'll be using some guess um, to try and then get a model of the mean to then correspond to the measured data and so on. But here I've known the I know the object exactly, so I'm just doing there you go a rotating set of lines. You saw those line integrals being taken at different angles, just rotating around the field of view. And by doing that, you can see here, I've got this beautiful noise-free sinogram because this is noise-free and so that is also noise-free. And that is gonna be acting as a model of the mean of that noisy Poisson distributed data. And here, all I did was take the sinogram data, which was obtained by forward projection along all those lines. And then I just used the transpose of that matrix uh, because obviously the mapping from that um, object to the sinogram can be captured by a matrix, which is what we'll be looking at more in this very video. So hang on in there. Um, but what I did here was just um, take an empty array um, and then just back project the data along the lines from which uh, the four projected data had come. So uh, you saw those lines rotating around like that. So that was for the line integrals to get the sinogram, just a stack of those projections. Here, what I did was just take those projection values and then back project them along those different lines at the different angles. Okay, so if we have uh, more point sources here, and again, I'm showing the actual known true, but in reality, we just have this noisy data as a sinogram or as a back projected image. But just to show what we would do if we had a perfect reconstruction and we're now forward modeling to get the mean of that set of parameters, then you can see here, this is really drawing out the key distinction between the noise in the measured data and a forward projection of a reconstructed image, which is always seeking to model a mean. Obviously, we don't always get great reconstructions, but what we produce by forward projection is nonetheless our best model of a mean, and it could be quite different, of course, but it will not have noise in it. And notably, you see that every single point source here has gone to a perfect uh, sine wave on the sinogram. So even if this was corrupted by noise, each of those noise spikes would give a perfect uh, sinogram here. Right, uh, in terms of a sine wave per point source, even if it's a noise point source. And so it wouldn't necessarily agree with the 
with what the true uh, sinogram should look like. And then here again is just a model of the mean back projected image, which is you know, clearly very different to the noisy one here. And you can see again here, we've just got the collection of familiar looking point sources. Okay, um, just carrying on that concept a bit more now for the Shep Logan Phantom. Here I'm simulating various back-to-back -back photon pairs, collecting sinogram data over here, and back projecting into that array. So again, as I collect more events, you can see this rapidly um, fills up with counts. There I've got 150,000 counts, and here they've been back projected. And then again, if I use that same model, um, I get a model of the mean here and a back projected image here. Now, this is really as good as it gets for modeling the mean because, as you can see, I used the ground truth. In general, during an iterative reconstruction, we would have some guess or some current improved estimate of the image, if you like here, which we would then forward model to get the corresponding model of the mean and, if needed, a model of the back projected image. So here, this is really, it uh, looks like a perfect correspondence because I've just gone ahead and used the, the true the true image, if you like. Okay, so let's take uh, a look then at uh, the linear operator that, that basically is doing those line integrals. So how do we get from a point source to a sinogram? Well, hopefully your knowledge of matrix vector multiplication should be pretty strong by now. And so a matrix A, to do that mapping, and that's the question here, how do we find that matrix? Hopefully it should be clear um, that, for example, if... Uh, the input vector to a forward model to model the mean of a sinogram. So notice here that shouldn't have noise in it. This is modeling the mean. Um, then, you know, if this is just a point source, then that might be just a, a one hop vector as the parameter vector. <clears throat> and that would pick out just one column in that uh, system matrix, um, which should then correspond to the vector which represents that sinogram. So again, maybe to spell out here that these, this vector on the right-hand side and the vector on the left-hand side are just, if you like, unrolled versions of these two. So this sinogram is like a 2D array of numbers that I've just unrolled into a column vector. Likewise, um, the current parameter vector um, is obviously a vector, but normally it's interpreted with a voxel or pixel basis, and that's why we get that image at the top right corner there. Um, so we just want to we want to explore a bit more how that matrix looks and how it is formed. Um, so what we would do, for example, is we could simulate or we could measure data from point sources inside the scanner. So here's a point source in a particular location inside the scanner field of view. This might be the collected data. Um, so obviously um, that point source in the field of view nonetheless uh, is representative of an object which is a parameter vector and so that's why I'm showing it in vector form there because these could just be listed into a column vector and then this is um, the set of numbers that make up the sinogram and the point is that's a vector which I use to populate a column of the system matrix that would correspond to um, the element in the input vector that would correspond to that point source location. So again, if we've got a point source, that's like a one-hot vector that would be on the right-hand side here, which would correspond to a point source in the field of view. And we know that if that's the only input vector, if that's the only element in the input vector that's non-zero, and if it goes into this matrix, we know that the prediction of the data, the model of the mean, should be that sinogram. So therefore, that one-hot vector just picks out one column of the matrix to deliver a correct modeled sinogram output. And so the point is, we can do this for lots of different point sources at different positions inside the scanner field of view. And as you can see, therefore, we're just visiting different um, elements of the input parameter vector that represents the object, in other words, the reconstructed image, if you like. And um, for each one of those, um, we are needing to have a column of the system matrix that models the mean response to a point source in that location. So here, as it's written, hence the system matrix contains columns, which are the responses to point sources at different positions in the scanner field of view. Um, 
Or, um, so we can look at it that way, uh, it's like a, a weighted collection of columns of the system matrix as being the forward projection process. In other words, if you put in a, an arbitrary parameter vector, collection of weights for different point sources, that corresponds to a collection of weights for the various sinograms, that each sinogram corresponding to a point source, you just add them all together, and that would give you uh, the modeled uh, sinogram. Alternatively, and it's the same thing, it's exactly the same matrix, we could consider rows of that matrix. This matrix, by the way, is, is really often referred to as um, the discrete X-ray transform, more generally. Some do call it the discrete radon transform, but you have to be careful there because that's only really the case for 2D. Here, we're expecting this to hold for 2D and 3D, and so it's safer to refer to it as the X-ray transform because then we're still dealing with lines in both 2D and 3D, whereas I think the 3D radon transform would be dealing with planar integrals, which is not what we're doing when we're collecting line integrals for PET system modeling. Um, so, okay, we could look at this um, X-ray transform, discrete X-ray transform matrix, and it was the matrix that performs line integrals, which is really at the core of the geometry of the PET measurement process, we could, we could look at the rows and consider them as just simply doing line integrals. So I refer you again to the much earlier video that I gave where I explained how a line integral um, would look um, in a matrix operating on some input image. And I showed an example of, of how the scalar product achieves a line integral because what we have then to do a line integral in other words to get the output bin of a sinogram say at um, some first row element um, in the output sinogram here what you need to do is take um, this row vector which corresponds to a, an image of a line mainly at zero but just got a few ones or close values close to one depicting the you know for the line um, you need to take that and multiply it point by point by whatever input vector you want to be forward projecting along. So if you had some image of a brain that you wanted to get the line integral for, then that image of the brain would just be um, unlisted into a column vector. You multiply point by point by point with this image of a line. That will just keep the values along the line through that brain image and then you sum them all up, and that gives you the line integral at the output there. It's just a scalar product. Okay, and so the point is you can consider all the various lines of response through the scanner field of view, and that's how you populate uh, the rows of a system matrix for doing uh, a discrete 2D radon transform or a discrete um, X-ray transform. Um, and the point is, system modeling is extremely flexible. We'll, we'll go into more detail for exactly what is done um, for the simultaneous PET-MR scanner at St. Thomas's. Uh, but here, I just want to convey concepts of system modeling. And so I just point out here that, you know, for example, if we had time of flight information for the PET photons, then you know, we could just do a Gaussian probability density function along that line. Instead of it being a solid line, um, more or less the same value all the way along, according to the arrival time difference of a particular um, event in the, in the sinogram data, then we could have um, like a weighted integral where we, we have some kind of Gaussian modulation along, along the line and that would um, model the time of flight um, data. Um, now another key point here is that whilst I'm, being, whilst I'm insisting on matrices here, um, you may recall one of the reasons we're considering iterative reconstruction is that we do not want to, or rather we cannot, store the system matrix in memory. And so it's really crucial to note here that often these elements of the matrix are calculated as required on the fly during reconstruction. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be going through methods that use, uh, like, for example, a row-based access of the system matrix on demand during reconstruction. And, and so one method would be like a ray tracing method, such as Siddons method, um, where you take your current image, image of the brain, whatever it might be, your current reconstructed image that you're iterating to improve, and then you would just literally visit pixels or voxels along a line and you just look at the line intersection length of each pixel or voxel, and then you just simply take a weighted sum along that line to get 
uh, the output value, um, for example, for a sinogram bin for that forward model. Okay, and so here, just um, nonetheless to carry on with the concept, um, the system matrix contains rows which indicate which pixels or voxels contribute to each measurement in your output vector, which is typically um, you know, a sinogram, so multiple sinogram bins. And uh, for 3D PET, it would obviously be a huge set of fully 3D sinograms. So in summary then, uh, the system model, the core part, but not the complete model for, for PET imaging, uh, would look like this. Um, if you like, again, it's the discrete X-ray transform, but we will be getting on to concepts like attenuation, scatter, randoms, normalization um, in, a, in a later video. Um, that'll be after reading week when we really go into specifics for PET reconstruction. But here, staying with the concept, uh, you can see therefore that the rows um, the rows of this matrix would correspond to lines through the field of view and uh, the columns would correspond to sinogram um, measurements or sinogram responses to point sources. Okay, um, so up to now also with the back projected PET data, we've been largely using the matrix H and uh, now I've introduced, um, if you like, the matrix A that takes us from parameters to the sinogram. And then the transpose of A is like back projection, which takes us from the sinogram to a back projected image, okay? So when we've been dealing with back projected images and using a matrix H, in effect, that has been forward modeling uh, to get a sinogram, and then back projecting to get a back projected image. So A transpose A, is that matrix H um, that we've been focusing on um, in previous uh, sections of these lectures. And so here I'm literally showing you um, the matrix A. Um, so this is just the first part here, the forward projector. Uh, there is the full uh, matrix. Obviously I had limited memory here. Um, so it's, a, it's about an 80 by 80, or I think it looks like 81 by 81 um, image. And so that means uh, one row of the system matrix A. So here you can see obviously all the vectors are stacked you know, in rows and obviously also in columns. If I go across one row of that and, and kind of reformat it into an image, I get this um, image of a line as expected. Um, if I take one column of that matrix A, um, then as expected, we get um, a sinogram. Okay, and so here there are, looks like 97, um, 97 by 81 elements in the sinogram, and there were 81 by 81 elements making up um, the, the image, if you like. Um, so that's the matrix A literally shown, uh, example row, example column of A, and now here I'm showing A transpose A, which is that matrix H that we've been looking at a lot. So the first thing to look at really is one row, or indeed actually maybe better to think of one column, because that would correspond to the point spread function that we've been working with. Now for 2D PET, I mean, okay, it's not that obvious, but these columns should be more or less representing the same point spread function, but just shifted to different positions. So here I've taken, I think, the central column and reformatted that into a 2D image. And so sure enough, we get the central uh, point source. Um, it is a, a symmetric matrix, and so the, the rows and columns uh, should look alike. Okay, so having now commented on and described more the system modeling, uh, or rather a core part of the system model for PET, um, I'm just on this slide referring to the fact that whereas before we did direct regularized least squares methods with the matrix H, which was basically that point spread function matrix, where indeed though the point spread function can change according to, to position of the point source in the field of view because it's not the 2D PET that we've just looked at. In general, it's gonna be 3D and it can be variant. Um, what I'm now showing on this slide is that we could also use that matrix A, in other words, operate on the sinogram data 
to get a least squares estimate. So you can see it's directly comparable. The only things that have changed are instead of a back projected image G, I'm using the sinogram data M. Um, instead of um, the matrix H, I'm using the matrix A. Um, and um, so those are two alternative ways of doing it. Um, again, these are not done in practice, but to the best of my knowledge, I would not really expect any real difference in performance in the reconstruction between these two options. Uh, it's more about compactness of your data. So that back projected image G, if it hasn't been compromised in terms of data accuracy when forming the back projection, um, that will give just as good as a, good a result, but it's going to be far more compact in data size compared to a fully 3D set of sinograms. And that's why, in fact, um, I would say that back projected images might be on their way back for PET. Now that we're doing time of flight data, you can actually form back projected images using time of flight information, and that gives you far greater localization. And from those histo images, you can begin to do a kind of back project then filter type reconstruction, or indeed you could do something like this if you have the capacity to store the matrix in memory, which is a big if. Okay, and so that's with uh, Tikhonov regularization and um, just pointing out here, this was for the back projected image case. And just to read out the top of the slide, um, this was obviously for sinogram data M. Okay, so that was covering um, kind of introductory concepts to iterative reconstruction and just unpacking a bit more of what goes into a core component of the system, system model for, for PET imaging. Um, the next uh, part of the lecture will we'll start with um, an intuitive example of iterative reconstruction, which really just sets the tone for lots of iterative methods to understand how they all basically function. Thank you.